Hi, I'm Sally Mullen. I'm here at the Hartford Artisans Weaving Center in Hartford, Connecticut to demonstrate how to dress a floor loom. We like to say that there are many right ways to dress a loom, but today we'll share with you our preferred back to front method along with some great tips and techniques. This video will be helpful for beginner weavers, but it will also reinforce the process for more advanced weavers and for our own students and volunteers here at the Weaving Center. So, let's get started. First, we need to gather our materials. You'll need a warp, a rattle, lease sticks, lease cords, a measuring tape, scissors, paper, and a sleigh hook. Your lease cords need to be long enough to reach from the front to the back of the loom with enough excess to tie at either end. For this baby wolf loom, the cords should be at least 60 inches long. We like to use these shoelaces, which have nice plastic ends for ease of lacing. Your lease sticks should also be an appropriate length. They need to be wider than your warp, but no wider than your loom. There are several types of rattles that serve to spread the warp as it is wound onto the beam. We're using a shacked rattle, which has brackets designed specifically for this slanted back beam of the baby wolf. If your loom has a flat back beam, you can simply place your rattle on that surface and tie it in place. If your loom has a slanted back beam, but you don't have the shacked rattle, you can use long sticks, often called angel wings, to support the rattle. They run through the harnesses, resting on the front breast beam and the back beam, creating a flat surface for your rattle. You can also place your rattle on top of your harnesses. Next, tie your lease cords onto either side of the breast beam using a slip knot. Carry them around the outside of the castle to the back of the loom. Thread one cord through the two lease sticks and tie it to the back beam. We prefer to keep these nice and taut. Divide your heddles and push them to the sides of the harnesses, which are also called shafts. Find the end of your warp that has the cross. Feed the warp over the front beam and beater, through the harnesses, and to the back of the loom. Carefully find all four legs of the cross, open them up, and insert the lease sticks, one through each side of the cross. Now you can lace the second lease cord through the lease sticks in the same manner and tie that cord to the back beam. At this point, it's a good idea to double check that your cross is secured correctly in the lease sticks. Check above, below, and through the cross to see that there are no escaped or confused warp threads. The next step is dispersing your warp evenly onto the rattle. From the center of the rattle, Measure out one half the intended width of your warp to the right of center. So if my scarf is 10 inches wide, I'll measure five inches out to the right. This is where you'll start spreading out your warp. If you introduced a counting thread while winding your warp, you will now be rewarded. A counting thread divides your warp into one inch bouts and makes this step much easier. Gradually loosen your counting thread and place the loop of each one inch bout over the nail or peg of the rattle. If you do not have a counting thread, you will count out the number of ends you need directly from the cross between the lease sticks. For example, if your warp is set at 12 ends per inch, then you will count off 12 ends in the cross. You'll notice that these 12 ends are actually six loops. Each loop which goes over a nail contains two warp ends. Continue until your entire warp is spread out on the rattle. When you're done, the width should equal the intended weaving width of your warp. Now we need to transfer these bouts onto the apron rod or bar. Whether you have individual apron cords or one continuous cord, place each cord or section of a continuous cord onto a rattle peg directly above the point at which it is attached to the warp beam. Unless your warp is very wide, a cord will be the first thing you slide onto your apron bar. 
slide the first apron cord onto the apron bar. Lift the first loop of warp off the peg and place it between the pegs. Now both sides of the one inch bout are in the same space between the pegs. Draw that loop down and onto the apron bar as you insert it. Repeat this process, sliding warp loops and apron cords onto the bar. Be especially careful to keep the bar lower than the rattle. Raising the apron bar above the rattle will cause you to lose the precise sections you've created. It's really easy to make this error, so try to be aware of that as you proceed. Once you are done looping the warp onto the apron bar, place rubber bands over the rattle pegs to secure the warp. Step on the brake release pedal and, using the handle, wind the warp beam just enough to take up the slack of the apron cords. Once you have some tension on that, just check to see that everything is aligned properly. Your warp bouts should be separate and parallel. Your apron rod should be straight and parallel with the warp beam. Next, it's time to insert some paper. Select paper that is a bit wider and longer than your warp. A roll of wallpaper is great because of its long length. You can also use paper bags which have been cut open, brown craft paper, heavy wrapping paper, sticks, or shelf paper. Step on the brake pedal and wind until the apron bar meets the warp beam. Insert the paper between the warp beam and your warp. Getting it straight at the outset sets you up for success the rest of the way. Winding paper onto the warp beam separates each layer of warp, which provides a nice equal tension on every warp thread. This is an important step as it will affect the tension throughout the entire weaving process. It is worth emphasizing that whenever you advance the warp beam, you need to step on that brake pedal. Releasing the brake protects the brake drum as you wind, so always step on the brake pedal when you wind. Now it's time to wind on the warp. Step on the brake pedal and wind for a couple rotations without any tension on the warp. Watch your leaf sticks for any snags or irregularities in tension in the warp. After winding a couple rotations, come to the front of the loom. Grasp the warp and pull firmly to remove any slack from within the paper on the warp beam. You can use the breast beam or the base of the loom as leverage when pulling. Try to resist sticking your fingers into the warp and combing at this point. You're aiming for an equal and consistent tension across all the warp ends, and combing can pull individual threads to a different tension. Keep an eye on the paper as you continue to wind on. If it starts to slide to one side, just a gentle tug will help it realign. Add more paper as necessary. Continue this process of alternating winding and pulling until the end of the warp reaches the breast beam. Cut the loop at the end of the warp. You now have individual warp ends and are ready to begin threading the heddles. It's important to pay attention to your body while threading. One tip to make this a more comfortable process is to choose a low stool or bench and to raise the harnesses up closer to your eye level. Lift the harnesses and place a coffee can or cone of yarn beneath them. Divide your heddles evenly on both sides of the harnesses. Extra heddles, which will not be used for this threading, must be equally balanced on each side of the harnesses in order for shafts to rise and drop smoothly. From your draft, determine how many heddles are needed on each harness. If you need additional heddles, now is the time to add them before you begin threading. We have a warp with 120 ends, which will be threaded in a straight draw. One, two, three, four. 120 divided evenly among the four shafts equals 30 heddles per shaft. We'll count out 15 heddles on the right side of each harness. There's no need to count the 15 on the left side, as we'll just use those as needed. Pull aside one repeat of heddles to begin threading. Since we are threading this warp on a straight draw, we'll pull aside one heddle from each harness. One, two, three, and four. 
These are the heddles for one threading repeat. There is a right and a wrong way to thread a heddle. The thread should pass through the eye with no resistance. If using a threading hook, this will be obvious as you insert the hook through the eye. If threading with your fingers, be sure the heddle is angled in the correct direction before threading it. You can see here how it looks if threaded incorrectly versus a correctly threaded heddle. Locate the first thread in the cross and thread it through the heddle on shaft number one. Continue to take the next thread from the cross and thread it through the next heddle in your sequence. In our case, that's harness number two. It's important to take the threads from the cross in the order in which they appear. Twisted threads are likely to cause problems later on. When you've completed a set, tie a loose slip knot at the end and double check your work. Double checking now helps to avoid more difficult corrections later. You may choose to pull aside a few sets of heddles at once, say enough to equal one inch, and tie them as a group. When you've completed the threading, it's time to slay the warp through the reed. Secure your beater in an upright position and choose the appropriate size reed. We're slaying one thread per dent in a 12 dent reed. Sometimes you will skip dents or thread two per dent or more, depending on your set and reed size. To center the warp in your reed, measure out from center to half the width of your warp. Our warp is 10 inches wide, so I'll measure five inches out to the right. Take the warp end from your first heddle and pass it through that first dent. Continue slaying, taking threads in the same order you've threaded them through the heddles. Accuracy is essential. Double check your work regularly at these stages, keeping an eye out for skipped or doubled dents or twisted threads. If you can catch your errors now, the corrections can be made much more easily than after you've begun weaving. Tie the slayed ends loosely with slip knots into one inch bouts. In our case, that's 12 ends per bout. When all the threads are slayed, it is time to tie the warp onto the apron bar. Check to see that your apron bar is straight. It should be parallel to the breast beam. Using our one inch bouts, begin at the center of the bar and work outward, alternating sides. Divide the bouts in half Bring the ends over the bar, then under it, and tie a half hitch, like starting to tie your shoe, on top of the bout. Do this for all the bouts. We can remove the leaf sticks and rattle at this point. Adjust the tension as needed and go back and tie the bouts into bows. Some weavers use a surgeon's knot or a square knot here. At the weaving center, we tend to have many hands on a project and we like to be able to untie these knots easily if necessary, so a bow works best for us. We're almost there, just a couple more steps to go. The treadles need to be tied up to the correct harnesses. This will be unique to your draft, but we decided on plain weave for this project, so we tied up one treadle to harnesses one and three and another treadle to harnesses two and four. Finally, we have to insert some filler to close the gaps between these bouts. We use any thick yarn and weave it in using plain weave until the spaces are closed and the warp ends are spread out evenly. You did it! Your loom is all dressed and now you're ready to weave. We hope this video helps to make your next weaving project fun and successful. Happy weaving!